there to the land of Zion, next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Habaa, the Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. O hear, O Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done next year. The Shana Habaa, the Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. Over there, over there in the land of Zion, next year. Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the dean of the Jewish Study School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and Hebrew College in Massachusetts. He is well qualified to bring you these Bible messages. This program is dedicated to bringing you relevant insight into the biblical text that pertains to our time. Here is Dr. Woodhead with today's Bible teaching. Good evening. I'm Daniel Woodhead and I will be bringing you a variety of Bible studies that are relevant to our times each week at this time and on this station. As I look at the news broadcasts that are coming to us today, I see a whole host of uh, skirmishes, some would say wars, that are taking place in the Mideast. Uh, we see uh, the group called Hamas and Hezbollah attacking Israel. We see the Russians coming in to the Ukraine and the Crimea. Uh, we see a whole host of wars that have been taking place in Syria for the last several years with over 100,000 casualties. Now we see a group, a newer, newer group, if you will, called ISIS or ISIL that is uh, attacking everything that they can come in contact with, uh, including a substantial portion of Iraq to try and establish a new caliphate, which is uh, a area, geographic region, under which they would have complete control. All civil, religious, and social practices would fall uh, under the domain of the new caliph, whomever that may be. Now there is world opinion about this, and I'm not here to discuss the world opinion with you, but what I am here to discuss with you is the fact that the Bible speaks to these issues. The Bible describes skirmishes and it describes wars and it's got multiple prophecies in the Old Testament to address these issues. Now I'm going to describe for you over the next eight weeks a prophecy in the 38th and 39th chapter of the book of Ezekiel and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how the events that are taking place now in the Mideast could be tied to this in the near future. The Bible does not tell us exactly when some of these prophecies are going to take place. It gives us a general time frame within the long chronology of the world, but it doesn't give us specific uh, times. You know, it doesn't say in, in uh, 2015 this will happen. There is a prophecy, though, that I want to spend time with, and I refer to it as the Allied Invasion of Israel by the Germans, the Muslim nations, and it's all led by the Russians. Now, these nations, in one form or another, have implemented severe persecutions on the nation Israel. And as we're going to see, examining this prophecy in detail, that God uses these events to repay those nations for causing harm to the Jews, which he refers to in Zechariah 2.8 as the apple of his eye. So, the Bible teaches us that to God alone belongs vengeance and nobody can repay the way he does. Uh, in fact, the Bible teaches that the Lord arranged the nations around his plan, the plan that he has for the Jews in their geography and in their different people groups. Now, about 4,350 years ago, 
God selected a man from the general population of Mesopotamia and called him Abraham. And he wanted Abraham to receive a special covenant. Now the Abrahamic covenant is the first unconditional covenant in the Bible that God made with the nation Israel. The Abrahamic covenant promised a seed, land, and blessings. Now, the three major promises of this covenant were personal promises to Abraham, national promises to Israel, and universal promises to all the people of the earth. God promised that he would bless him and make him a blessing to others, to make his name great, to give him many descendants, and make him a father of a multitude of nations. So he said, that is the Lord said, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan for always. And in terms of the Jews, he said, I will bless them that bless you, and I will curse them that curse you. So he gave the uh, Israelites some land, and they don't have it all yet, but they have a substantial portion of them. And what is important for us to see is that the promises to the nation Israel are being fulfilled today. They are being fulfilled today. They are in the land, but they're there in general unbelief, and <clears throat> they are here with a portion of the land. Now, these covenants that God makes in the Bible are very specific. God came to Abraham when he was a Gentile, and Abraham is the first Hebrew. I'm going to cite seven of these promises that are important as we begin this study because they are endemic, if you will, or foundational. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I will make thy name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now the sixth promise, I will curse him that curses thee, is what I'm going to be talking about over the next seven to eight weeks. Ezekiel is a prophet. <clears throat> he was a prophet in Israel. In 605 B.C., and we're going back quite a ways, we're going back 2,600 years, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem and sacked it and took away a whole host of the young people so that they could be trained up in the court of Babylon to do what the Babylonians needed to have done. And they set up a puppet king in Israel, and they left. The puppet king did not do what Nebuchadnezzar wants, so he came back in in 597 B.C. He sacked it again. He took away a whole host of people then, and one of those was a priest who was about 30 years old at the time, and his name was Ezekiel, 597 B.C. From 597 B.C. until 5. 86 BC, he made a whole host of prophecies about the nation Israel. One of these is what we're going to be looking at. Now, the Ezekiel prophecy that we're going to be looking at um, took place before the last invasion of Nebuchadnezzar, which was 586 BC. So there's three invasions, 605 BC, 597 B.C. and 586 B.C. Ezekiel was in Babylon making these prophecies that God had given him. I want to spend a bit of time today talking about the various persecutions that the Jewish people have undergone. We're going to look at the Russian persecutions, the Soviet persecutions, the German and the Muslim nations persecutions. We're going to look at, in subsequent messages, the world empires that the Bible speaks about, and we're going to look at where they lead. We're going to look at divine retribution 
the invading nations in this allied invasion of Israel, where do they come from? Where do they invade? Why are they invading? What happens to the invaders? How does it happen? How does God get blessed by this? And then we're going to look at the weaponry that's used. There is a subject uh, that has occupied many, many people for a long, long time, and that's Jewish persecution. I'm going to look at first the Russian persecution of the Jews. From 1721 on, the official doctrine of imperial Russia was openly anti-Jewish. For example, when the Russians captured part of the Ukraine in 1727, and what they did was they then took, uh, oh, excuse me, I lost my uh, slide here. Let me try and bring that back. When they uh, took control of the Ukraine, the Tsar established what was called a Pale of Settlement, and that included Poland and the Crimea. Now, the Jews were supposed to remain in this Pale, if you will, and in order to believe, they had to get special permission, and they were persecuted there. And specifically, in 1786, Catherine the Great of Russia ordered all Jews in her domain to move to an area in southwestern Russia and Poland known as the Pale of Settlement. Now, the Pale consisted of 25 provinces that included Ukraine, Lithuania, uh, Belarusia, Crimea, and part of Poland, <clears throat> arriving in massive numbers. The Jews eventually dispersed and uh, settled throughout the region of the Pale. Now, they were uh, specifically expelled from Moscow and St. Peter's and Petersburg, and they were forced into the Pale, and later they were also expelled from the rural areas within the Pale, and they were forced to live in these little teeny towns called the Shtetls. The Shtetls is a, well, it's a Yiddish word for small town. Tsar Alexander II, who was a Romanov and who was ultimately uh, assassinated, was known for his suppression of national minorities. Under his rule, the Jews could not commission any Christian servants. They couldn't own land, and they were restricted in their travel. What I find so interesting about Jewish persecution is it usually comes from Christians, <clears throat> and it usually comes from people that don't realize that Jesus is Jewish. And Jesus never uh, condemned the Jewish people. <clears throat> he condemned the people uh, that were the ruling authorities of his day, but not the people, because all of the early church were all Jewish people. Anyway, um, the next czar, Tsar Alexander III, uh, he just escalated the anti-Jewish policies. Uh, they were referring to, to these folks as Christ killers and oppressors. Um, there was a large number of anti-Jewish pogroms, and uh, by you get around 1881, um, they were blamed for the assassination of Alexander II. It's another outbreak, uh, and then the pogroms started where 166 Russian towns, where thousands of Jewish homes were, were destroyed. And uh, the families were reduced to poverty. Large numbers of men and women and children were injured. Some of them killed. The new uh, czar blamed the Jews for the riots. On May the 15th, 1882, he introduced so-called temporary regulations that stayed in effect for more than 30 years and came to be known as the May Laws. So there's been a systematic persecution. I don't want to spend a whole lot more time talking about that, but uh, if you call me at 1-877-706-2479 or write me, our post office box will be given by the announcer at the end of this show, I'll be happy to send you additional information on these subjects. So uh, I want to move on, though, to another persecution. And the reason I'm talking about these persecutions is because the groups that are persecuting the Jews or have persecuted the Jews are the groups that are going to gather together under the leadership of the Russians and come against Israel in this prophecy. Let's look at Nazi Germany. I think everybody knows, at least those of uh, you know middle age and beyond, what happened there for those 12 years that Adolf Hitler was in control. Nazi Germany was a militantly intolerant and violent group 
who considered the Jews to be foul, have shameful lives, and they subjected them to horrible treatment. First they wanted to expel them from Germany, and then they subjected them to cruel treatment and painful deaths. The Nazi used the same despicable kind of language that was found in Martin Luther's The Jews and Their Lies when describing them publicly. It also appeared in Hitler's Mein Kampf, which means my struggle, his personal biography and plan. You know, Nazi Germany didn't invent anything new regarding the treatment of the Jews. They just simply amplified the Jewish attitude inherent in European Christianity and its history. The constant question that arose in Hitler's party and later in his administration is, what do we do with the Jews? The issue became known as the Jewish question. They attributed to the Jews all their sources of economic and social problems. The answer became uh, found, if you will, in 1941, which they called the final solution. That's when they started exterminating them in large, large numbers. They had been putting them into uh, camps, if you will, and they had been working them to death and they had been uh, shooting them, but in 1941, they found that they could uh, develop, or this, uh, it was an pesticide, Zyklon B, and that's where they started gassing them in mass. So they implemented a, uh, a satanic practice of gassing these Jews in large, large volumes. Now, many said that Adolf Hitler was demonically driven, and one of the early founders of the Nazi party was a man named Dietrich Eckhart. And as he lay dying in 1923, he made the following statement about Hitler. He said, follow Hitler. He's going to dance. But it is I who has called the tune. I have initiated him into the secret doctrine, opened his centers and vision, and given him the means to communicate with the powers. Do not mourn for me. I shall have influenced Hitler, Hitler excuse me, history more than any other German. Now, he, this guy was a dedicated Satanist, and um, he was what we would call the forerunner of the Antichrist. That, that is Adolf Hitler. He's um, sort of like a John the Baptist was for Jesus, the forerunner, if you will. Well, Adolf Hitler gave us uh, the actual uh, format, if you will, of what this Antichrist coming on this earth someday is going to be doing. He stripped Jews of their households, of their jobs, of their money. He put them in camps, and he just started gassing them and burning them. First crematorium was operational in Auschwitz in uh, 1940. But it wasn't until the autumn of 1941 that that Zyklon B gas uh, was developed to expedite the mass murders. Interesting, you know. On May the 1st, 1945, Hitler committed suicide, and uh, Europe was devastated, and he had killed a minimum of 6 million Jews during his 12 years of totalitarian rule. He killed a lot of people. He killed a lot of other people as well. He set up an industrial-grade genocide. Now, I want to shift from there to the Muslim persecutions that have taken place. Now, as a direct result of the Nazi persecutions, on November the 29th, 1947, the United Nations created the State of Israel. And on May the 14th, 1948, Israel's Prime Minister, David Ben-Gurion, declared the creation of the State of Israel. They issued their uh, Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> Arab League members... Uh, from Egypt, Transjordan, Syria, uh, Lebanon, and Iraq declared war and announced their rejection of the United Nations partition plan. Saudi Arabia and Yemen uh, also sent forces to participate in the invasion. But this was not the first time the Muslims had persecuted the Jews. I'm going to take you back to 627 A.D., when fleeing a Meccan tribe, Muhammad, the founder of Islam, decided to attack the Jewish tribe of the Khareza, which had refused to convert to Islam. That's the same sort of a thing we hear the ISIS folks saying today. Um, he had trenches dug in the marketplaces of Medina, and according to Muslim sources now, Encyclopedia Britannica, Muslim sources, 
He beheaded between six and nine hundred Jewish men. One only was reported to have converted to Islam, and his life was spared. Now, the women, the children, and the property were divided amongst the Muslims. So, jihad, or holy war, is a permanent state of war for Islam, and it does not include the possibility of any true peace ever. It's been this way from the inception of Islam, and it's true today. Only the naive and the ignorant fall victim to the untruth of Islam being a peaceful religion. It never has been. It seeks world domination, and it's going to stop at nothing to achieve its ends. So in 1948, after the United Nations vote to give Israel statehood, these five Muslim armies of Egypt, Syria, Transjordan, Lebanon, and Iraq, they immediately invaded Israel. The stated purpose of the invasion was to push the Jews into the sea. In other words, genocide. Uh, Assam Pasha, who was Secretary General of the Arab League, declared their intentions. This will be a war of extermination uh, and a momentous massacre. It's going to be spoken of like the Mongolian massacres and the Crusades. What Hitler didn't finish three years earlier, the Arabs would finish once and for all. Now, there was a Nazi collaborator during the war named Haj Amin al-Husseini, and uh, he led the Arabs of the former British Mandate, which is what uh, Palestine was called at the time. He was charged at the Nuremberg trials, but he escaped in 1946 before being convicted. Now, al-Husseini actively supported Hitler's aim to exterminate the Jews in World War II. The Jews prevailed, though, with only World War I weapons against all these Muslim nations. And it was only weapons that the Czechoslovakians would give them. No one else helped them. Now, there are plenty of pieces of information, some of which I'll touch on over the next eight to ten weeks or so, about the miraculous survival of the Jews, and this is one of them in that very first war. In 1949, Israel signed armistice agreements with Israel, or excuse me, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and Chan Transjordan. And then um, in April 1949, uh, Transjordan changed its name to Jordan. At this time, at this time, Jordan annexed Judea and Samaria. That's what is commonly being called the West Bank now. The region became a source of a whole host of terrorist attacks against Israel's citizens. And in 1945, um, there were about 870,000 Jews living in the surrounding Arab countries. The Muslim called them Dhmini. Uh, during the 1948-49 um, time frame, there, the Arabs persecuted these Jews right after the independence. Their personal real property was confiscated. Um, Yemen, Egypt, Libya, Syria, Iraq, they all had anti-Jewish riots. Zionism was declared to be a capital crime in Iraq, and uh, approximately 600,000 Jewish refugees left the Arab states and were welcomed into Israel by the Ashkenazi Jews that were living there at the time. So the Jews became full citizens of Israel. Due to the wishes of their Arab leaders, the Arabs of, in Israel did not become citizens, but remained in internment camps and remained refugees, waiting to get into the Arab nations. But the Arabs wouldn't let them in. Now, having lost in battle, Palestinian Arab terrorist groups called the Fedayeen uh, began systematic raids into Israel, civilian population, and uh, 1,300 Israelis were killed and wounded by Arab terrorists between 49 and 56. Now, the Americans at that time were helping the Jews, and the Soviets aided the Muslims. The transfer of power from the Jews and the Muslims went to the United States and the Soviet Union the Eastern and the Western Bloc of World Powers. On May the 15th, 1967, Nasser of Egypt ordered a blockade of the Strait of Tehran, and this blockade cut off Israel's southern access to the Red Sea and beyond. Well, my goodness, by um, May the 31st, it's only two weeks later, uh, Egypt had moved 100,000 troops, 1,000 tanks, and 500 heavy guns into the Sinai. By June the 4th, Arab forces outnumbered the Israelis 3 to 1 as they poised on Israel's borders. Now, this was Israel's six-day war, and it was fought on three fronts against three countries in three overlapping stages, one in the south, 
uh, in where Israel engaged and defeated the Egyptians in the central region. They engaged and defeated the Jordanians, and in the north, Israel engaged and defeated the Syrians. Now, in each of these theaters, Israel gained significant land. They got territory that would serve as buffers in future years. On the morning of June the 5th of 1967, uh, the Israeli Air Force destroyed almost the entire Egyptian Air Force, more than 300 planes in less than three hours. Israel's armored divisions under the leadership of General Ariel Sharon also launched what they called a lightning attack on the same day. More than 800 Egyptian tanks had been destroyed and thousands of soldiers were taken as prisoners of war. Uh, and at Nasser, the Egyptian president, later acknowledged that 80%, that's 80% of Egypt's Russian-supplied military equipment had been lost in the Sinai. Now, this was a debacle. Finally, at 8 p.m. on June the 8th, Nasser accepted a ceasefire. From 48 to 67, Jerusalem was a divided city. Uh, the Arab League of Jordan had occupied East Jerusalem, including the old city, since the War of Independence. And the, the Jordanian troops had decimated the Jewish quarter of the old city, blowing up synagogues, destroying every vestige of Jewish life there. During the initial battle with Egypt, Israel actually notified King Hussein of Jordan that it had no intention of attacking his country. Hussein, however, believed Nasser's lies and joined the Arabs. Uh, when the Arab Legion began to shell western Jerusalem, the Israelis swiftly counterattacked with success. So paratroopers landed and attacked from the Mount of Olives, which is on the eastern side of the Temple Mount, across the Kidron Valley, and they entered the Lion Gate from the east. Israel was very, very careful to minimize the use of artillery, uh, which would have made their attack a whole lot easier, but would have had more loss of life. So this was done out of respect for the numerous holy sites within the ancient walls. And by June the 8th, well, uh, Israel's troops were gazing at Herod's stones on the western wall. So now, although that Jerusalem was the central prize, Israel also captured in those four fierce days of, fright, uh, uh, of fighting uh, biblical Judea and Samaria. As I said, they're calling it the West Bank now. So Egypt's ally uh, to the north was Syria, and the Syria uh, group there had um, harassed farmers for a long time, and th that was what we call the Golan Heights. So the Golan Heights were taken back. It was an amazing military victory. Uh, the Jews prevailed against all odds. They did so in the 73 war, but I think it's important to look at this. The essence of this is uh, in 1991, S.A.A. A. Uh, Maudidi, a uh, Muslim, wrote the following words in a publication called Jihad in Islam. Islam wishes to destroy all states and governments anywhere on the face of the earth, which are opposed to the ideology and program of Islam. Islam requires the earth, not just a portion, but the whole planet and that God's law, Sharia, should be enforced in the world by force of arms. Truth cannot be confined within geographical order, borders. Um, the allegiance of a Muslim does not rest on his domicile in the country in which he is living, but on his faith to which he belongs. Wherever there is the rule of Islam, there is his own country. Now, I will be back with you next week to bring you uh, a lot more of this message. Uh, please listen to our announcer, and he has an offer for you. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. If you would like a DVD of today's program, please write us at Post Office Box 384, Pentwater, Michigan, 49449. That's Post Office Box 384 Pentwater, Michigan 49449. Or call us at 1 877 706 2479. That's 1 877 706 2479. 
Once again, that's one 706 2479 The cost is $15. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you. To the land of Zion, next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Habaa, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, O hear, O Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Next year, the Shana Habaa, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. Over there, over there in the land of Zion, next year in Jerusalem.